Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that is going to be very frustrating to listen to as it was very frustrating for me to research. It's one of those cases that seems like there's such an obvious answer, but it technically has not been proven. So really, we don't really know what happened. But with that being said, I think that this case truly has the potential to be solved and I think the right person needs to see it in order for it to be solved and that is why I'm making today's video. I'm just hoping to spread information and bring awareness to Tommy's case so that the right person can see this video and that they can come forward with what they know. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Birch Living. As we all know, sleep is a vital component of our health and well-being. As a healthcare student, I realize just how important it is to get a good quality of sleep every single night in order to stay healthy and live your life to the fullest. This is is something that I try my best to live my life by and is something that's important to discuss with patients as well. Birch Living makes organic, non-toxic mattresses made within the U.S. with just four materials obtained from nature. Organic latex, New Zealand wool, American steel springs, and organic cotton. As you guys have heard me say before, it's really important for me to live my life the most sustainably that I can, so I try my best to use organic and natural materials whenever I can. And that is why I love Birch Mattress. Not only is their mattress made from non-toxic natural materials, but it's also incredibly comfortable and comes with their two breathable eco-rest pillows made from recycled plastic bottles. Now, like I mentioned in a previous video, I do have some pretty intense sleeping problems. I have spent so many nights going to bed at a reasonable time, but I somehow end up staying up all night because I just can't sleep, because I just can't get comfortable, and that just does not work when I have to be up at 7 a.m. the next day to work and do school stuff. I honestly never realized that the comfort of my mattress is a huge contributing factor of how well I sleep. I've been sleeping on my Birch mattress for a couple of months now, and it honestly changed the game and how comfortable I'm able to get and how much sleep I'm able to get and the quality of sleep that I'm able to get. Now, buying a nice mattress can be intimidating, but Birch Living makes it incredibly easy. You just go to their website and buy it online and it's delivered to your door for free anywhere within the US. It comes rolled up in a box and it's pretty easy to set up all by yourself. I also loved that when I pulled my Birch mattress out of the box, it didn't have that chemical smell that you smell on most other box mattresses. My boyfriend was actually worried about me setting it up inside versus outside and letting it sit outside to get rid of the chemical smell for a while, but it didn't even have the chemical smell whatsoever. He was worried about this because pretty much any other mattress that comes rolled up in a box, when you open it up, it has this weird chemical smell that makes you just feel unhealthy breathing it in. But Birch Mattress didn't have any weird chemical smell whatsoever, which makes me just feel so much better that I'm not breathing in any weird chemicals. Now, if it makes you a little bit nervous to buy a mattress that you haven't tried it yet, Birch Living has you covered with their 100 night sleep trial. You have over three Three months to make sure that you love it and if for some reason you don't, they'll pick it up for you and they'll give you a full refund. Plus, you get a 10-year warranty if you do decide that you love your mattress, which I think you will. Honestly, Birch Living makes it so easy to just go ahead and give their mattress a try. I love my mattress and I really think that you will too. The exciting news is that if you go ahead and click the link down below or go to birchliving.com slash Rachel Shannon, you can get $200 off of your mattress plus two free pillows. It's never been easier and more cost-effective to invest in better sleep and better health. Thank you again to Birch Living for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into the video. Today, we are going to be discussing the suspicious death of Thomas Jodry. Thomas Robert Jodry was a New Year's Eve baby being born on December 31st, 1997 to parents Mary Jane and William Jodry, and the family lived in Atascadro, California. Tommy was described as an easy baby and child growing up. He was described as being inquisitive, playful, and smart. He loved writing and art and loved sports and playing guitar. As a child, he loved playing with his cars and trucks, but his favorite toy was his Toy Story Woody doll. In elementary and junior high school, he was basically the 
perfect student who got really good grades. He was so good at writing that he even won several awards over the years. He absolutely loved playing sports. He had played soccer, then baseball, then golf by the time he had reached high school. He was always so focused on just getting better at his craft, but he wasn't overly competitive, and honestly, as long as he put in his best effort, he was happy. Out of every sport that he had participated in throughout his life, skateboarding had always been his favorite. When he was a teenager, he even participated in the local monster skate series and even won. Another passion of Tommy's was traveling. He loved going anywhere from Mexico to the Caribbean to Europe. And no matter where his travels took him, he could always make friends. He was always appreciative of life and those around him. To him, there was no such thing as a language barrier. However, by the time he reached high school, Tommy did start to struggle a little bit, as do a lot of young teenagers who are starting this next chapter in their lives. When he was a freshman, he was bullied quite a bit. By a sophomore year of high school, his self-esteem seemed to go down pretty dramatically. Due to this, he actually started seeing a therapist who he actually really loved and who helped him gain control of his life. So after this, he picked himself back up and he was back at it again. He actually owned and managed a cactus and succulent selling business. He mostly operated his business online, but he had actually just purchased a 2001 Chevy pickup truck to expand his business to local flea markets. He was so proud of his business and his work since he had been working on getting it off the ground since he was only 12 years old. He even had his own entire garden of cacti and succulents in the family's yard. Now, sometime in 2019, Tommy had begun speaking to an acquaintance named David Knight. The two had spoken and bonded for several weeks over their shared appreciation of art. On the morning of September 14th, 2019, Tommy had told his parents that he was going to be meeting up with this acquaintance because this man was going to be purchasing a cactus from him. The two were also meeting up because this man told him that he was a photographer and he was going to help him expand his business by taking pictures of his product so that he could make it even easier to sell them online. So essentially, this was supposed to be some sort of business meetup where they had also planned to go to Cal Poly to look at some art, to talk about business, and get some new creative ideas. Now, just a few weeks before his death, Tommy had actually gotten into a skateboarding accident that left him needing surgery in his right elbow. So he got the surgery, and around this time, he was still recovering. He was in an arm brace at this time, and he wasn't really allowed to lift more than 10 pounds, so he wasn't able to fully work. He also wasn't able to drive a car or ride his bike, so because of this, William, Tommy's dad, had stepped in to help him with his cactus business. Even though Tommy did still live at home, this was Tommy's best bet at making enough money to sort of get by, and it was honestly a way for Tommy to still be able to branch out and talk to people and be social, which is something that he really enjoyed. So on September 14th at around 2 p.m., Tommy's dad, William, had been working on Tommy's cactus garden at the house when he noticed a man pulling up to the house. He saw this man pick up his phone to make a phone call while he was still in the car. Of course, William just naturally assumed that this was one of Tommy's customers, so he walked up to the car to ask him if he could help with anything. At the time, William didn't really know who this man was, so he asked him what he can do for him, and the man asked for Thomas. So William informed him that Tommy didn't always answer his phone, so instead of calling him, William said that he will go ahead and just go get him. Him. So, he went and got Tommy, and Tommy told him that this man was David Knight. He had told his dad about him before. He told him that he was a photographer and that he was going to help him get his art published. So, he told his dad about his plan to meet up with this man and then go look at some art at Cal Poly. So, Tommy went up to this man and introduced David to his dad, and then Tommy got into David's car and the two left. Now, like I said, the two had planned to go to Cal Poly, but when they arrived, they realized that it was the college's welcome week, so the campus was absolutely packed. People were trying to move in, families were helping their students with everything, so there was so much traffic that it was pretty much impossible for them to get into campus. Because of this, the two left and then they went to go get lunch together, and then after that, they went to visit Montana de Oro State Park. They spent a few hours there before finally heading over to San Luis Obispo. At around 7 p.m. that same night, Tommy had texted a friend saying, I'm going to be going home soon, we are finally going to be looking at some art. To which this friend replied that he was about to go camping with his girlfriend and wouldn't be home to see him for a couple of days. Then, at around this time, David and Tommy went to Kreutzberg Coffee on Hugera Street. They noticed that there was a comedy show going on at the coffee shop that Tommy was interested in seeing, but David didn't want to pay the cover charge to watch the show, so the two left and instead went to the Frog and Peach Bar, 
also on Hugera Street, around a block away from the coffee place to go ahead and get some drinks. According to employees who worked at the bar, the two arrived at around 8 p.m. Now, the first of many strange things that would happen this night was that at around 8.05 p.m., David had sent a text to Tommy's phone which said, fuck. You. It's not really known why David sent this message to Tommy, but David would later say that he was basically sending this message to Tommy's phone to just sort of check to see if he was getting his messages. But then he also said that Tommy didn't really look at his phone or respond to this text message. So it's just a little strange to opt to say F you to test if someone's getting your messages. I personally would just be like, hi, to see if someone was getting my messages or whatever, to see if they had my number in their phone. So given what happens in the rest of this case, that just seems like a really strange thing to text someone. So while at the Frog and Peach bar, David had opened a tab for both him and Tommy. Now, what was weird about this was that the two of them were there for about an hour and both of them were ordering drinks, but it seems like David was giving Tommy all of his drinks. According to employees and other witnesses, nobody saw David drinking any of his own drinks. So essentially, it looked like Tommy was drinking all of the drinks that he ordered for himself as well as all of the drinks that David was ordering. The two were there for about an hour and they ran up a bill of well over a hundred dollars which David paid for even though again he didn't drink any of his own drinks. Now I saw in one source that Tommy struggled with alcohol as a way to cope with some of the depression that he was dealing with in the recent months so he wasn't supposed to be drinking and he was actually supposed to be going to an alcohol rehabilitation soon. However I only saw that on one source and I didn't see that anywhere on the website that his parents made for his case so I don't know if this is totally accurate. I do know though that when they asked him why David took him to a bar rather than literally literally anywhere else, David didn't really have a straight answer. Now, his parents did say that Tommy wasn't the best at handling his alcohol, so essentially he was a lightweight, so Tommy should not have been drinking very heavily. However, either way, Tommy ended up drinking a lot that night. It was said that he had something like six or seven shots of whiskey within that hour, which is a ton of alcohol, especially for someone who isn't the biggest guy and doesn't have a very good tolerance. There is surveillance video of the two at the bar and shortly before they left, the two appeared to get into somewhat of a falling out and then showed that Tommy abruptly left the bar after this argument. So pretty much what we know about what happened right after Tommy left the bar comes directly from David and a couple of other witnesses. So just after they left the bar, Tommy was stumbling around and ended up tripping and falling face first into the sidewalk. His face was bloody and all cut up and he was completely disoriented. Turns out at this time, he he had a blood alcohol level of 0.38, which is very high and is over four times over the legal limit. After falling, apparently Tommy became very upset and started running away from David. According to witnesses, as he was running away, he was yelling, help, somebody is after me. Still stumbling and not really getting his footing, he made it about a block eastbound on Hugera into a pedestrian walkway located between the Gap and downtown center cinemas. Once he made it by the Gap, Tommy fell again and this time he dropped his cell phone. David then went over to Tommy and picked up his cell phone off the ground and then took it with him. From my understanding, after this, according to David, he had just seemed to walk off, leaving Tommy laying there on the ground. After this, we don't exactly know how events had played out. What we do know is that shortly after 9 p.m., someone had called 911 to report that there was an intoxicated man that was stumbling around in a parking garage. Then, at around 9.15 a.m., a witness had called 911 to report that someone had fallen from the parking garage. But I will note that this person only saw someone laying on the sidewalk on the ground in front of the parking garage and did not actually see the fall or how it happened or what caused it. Police arrived and found a man lying unconscious on the sidewalk on the corner of Truro and Marsh Streets. Of course, police didn't know if this was the same man that a witness had called them a few minutes earlier about an intoxicated man walking around a parking structure, but they kind of just assumed that this was the same man. So of course, police arrived and started surrounding Tommy and a man who was unknown to police at the time 
but was later identified as David Knight, walked up to police to ask them what happened. The officer told David not to come any closer, but David told the officer that he knew this man. David identified the man as being Tommy, told them where he lived, but told officers that he did not want to be on record as saying that he knew Tommy. He also would not tell officers who he was and would not give them any further information. Tommy was then taken by ambulance to the Sierra Vista Hospital. As this was all happening, Tommy's parents were attending a concert in the park near their home, but they had gotten home at around 10 p.m. only to find that Tommy was still not home. Immediately, they were both alarmed by this, so they started calling Tommy's phone over and over again, but nobody was answering. But then, by 10.20 p.m., David showed up on the doorstep of the Jodry home and knocked on the door. William answered the door and David asked him if he remembered him and he said yes, but he asked him where Tommy was since he was trying to get a hold of him but was not able to reach him. This is when David told William that he actually had Tommy's cell phone and gave it to him. He said that he found the cell phone on the ground, that Tommy must have dropped it, but he didn't elaborate much beyond that. So William decided to invite David inside. David started telling them bits and pieces about what happened that night, but again, he didn't really say much. All he really said was that he lost Tommy somewhere downtown, and then as he was wandering by himself, he heard police sirens. He told them that after he had heard these police sirens, he went over to see what was going on and was shocked to see that someone who looked like Tommy was lying on the sidewalk near the parking garage. He told the Jodries that he went to the officers to try and get more information, but that the officers just were not giving any information up. So David told them to call the Sierra Vista Hospital, which also just so happens to be where William worked as a registered nurse. As William was making these phone calls to the hospital, Mary Jane, of course, was just so confused and worried and was just trying to ask David more questions about what happened that night. But according to them, David just sort of stonewalled her. He basically told her that he was just trying to hear William's conversation with the hospital, basically saying that she just needed to be quiet. David's attitude overall was just cold and rude and uncaring. After a few phone calls, William had finally gotten a hold of the hospital, and that is when they were informed that their son had actually been declared dead. Both William and Mary Jane just absolutely broke down and started hysterically screaming and sobbing. They just could not believe that their 21-year-old son was just dead so suddenly. However, as Tommy's parents were just trying to deal with this horrific news that they just received. David was still sitting on the couch and was rocking back and forth saying, how could Thomas do this to me? Which again is just so, so very strange. So William and Mary Jane called Mary Jane's brother who happened to live very closely to them and asked him to take them to the hospital. He got there very quickly, literally within three minutes. So when the brother got there and asked David what happened, David responded coldly and bluntly, he's dead. When the brother asked him again what happened, David said in an even more stern and sharp tone, he's dead. So at that point, William demanded that David leave, and according to the brother, David left, but he ran out to his car as fast as he could, looking at completely panicked. After this, the three left for the hospital, still in complete shock and disbelief. Once they got there, they were brought into Tommy's room, and that is when they identified his body. After a few minutes, police went over them and asked them how they knew that Thomas was even in the hospital. So, they went ahead and explained everything that happened with David Knight. Police had told them that David came over to them to identify Tommy at the scene, but then that he just ran off and wouldn't speak to them any further. After this, of course, Tommy's body was sent off for an autopsy, and this is when they found out that Tommy had this blood alcohol level of 0.38, more than four times the legal limit. And then, only two days after his death, police ruled out criminal activity, and by October, police came out and said that they had finished their reports, and they ruled Tommy's death as a suicide. Miguel Inazzo, the lead detective at the time, said that there were no witnesses or surveillance videos to show exactly what happened at the parking garage, but Tommy's parents knew that he was not suicidal. He had this amazing cactus and succulent selling business that he absolutely loved. He showed no signs of wanting to end his life and he was overall incredibly happy. So a few weeks after Tommy's death, his parents had received a report from a tracking app on Tommy's phone, which pretty much showed exactly where he went on the night of his death. 
It pretty much showed what we discussed. It showed that when he left home, he went to Cal Poly, then to Morro Bay, and then to the coffee place, and then to the Frog and Peach Bar. But then it shows that his phone was at the Marsh Street parking garage at 9.04 p.m. At the same time, David had called Tommy's phone from his own cell phone. Then, as we know, a few minutes later after this, Tommy had fallen to his death. So to me, this shows just a little bit more about what happened that night. This says to me that maybe David didn't leave Tommy's side when he was said to have originally fallen to the ground. It shows that at least Tommy's phone was up in the parking garage before he fell. So was David up there with Tommy's phone in his pocket? Or did David take Tommy's phone after he fell? So I'm not sure the exact timeline of this and it's not clear exactly why, but police did go back and change Tommy's cause of death from a suicide to saying that it was undetermined, saying that it could not be determined whether he fell, jumped, or was pushed from the third or fourth floor of the parking garage. So Tommy's family is left with so many questions. After the initial night when they told David to leave, they'd actually asked him to come back the next day to explain more about what happened and what caused their son to die but he never came back and he never spoke with the family ever again. So they were just left with these questions. Why would a man in his 50 buy a 21 year old six drinks within one hour? What was his motivation for bringing Tommy to a bar instead of just going home or going to another art institute? Why didn't he drink any of his own drinks instead just giving them to Tommy? So the parents filed a wrongful death suit against David Knight. They said that David Knight intentionally and proximately caused the death of Tommy after giving him six whiskey shots. They're seeking $250,000 for loss of financial support, funeral and burial expenses, loss of love, companionship, and more from Tommy's death. So David responded by coming back with a restraining order saying that he's been harassed continuously by them. He said that the Jodries incorrectly believe that he bears responsibility for the death of their son. At this point, David suddenly had a lot more to say about the night that Tommy died. In his restraining order request, he wrote that on the night of September 14th, after leaving the bar, Tommy became very erratic and was making derogatory comments towards a couple walking towards them on the street. He said that Tommy then got into a fight with an unknown male. David said that he tried to verbally de-escalate the situation, but that the man had actually punched Tommy in the face, causing Tommy to fall to the ground. David said that after Tommy got up, he walked across the street, yelling profanities at two women before he fell again. At this point, David said that Tommy had dropped his cell phone and that he ran over to Tommy to pick up his cell phone and see if he was okay. He said that when he went over to see if Tommy was okay, Tommy suddenly just got up and ran away with his arms flapping around. As he was doing this, David said that he was yelling at people as he was running, but he was running too fast for David to try and catch up to him to return his phone to him. He said that he lost sight of Tommy and then so he went and searched the streets for him, but then he noticed that there were police lights, so he went and checked it out. He said that at this time, he was concerned that Tommy had been hit by a car. He said that he went up to the officer and asked him if Tommy was still breathing, to which the officer said yes and then told him to get back. He said that when the ambulance took Tommy to the hospital, David got into his car and followed the ambulance to the hospital so that he could find out where he was being taken. Once he found out, he graciously went to Tommy's parents to return his cell phone back to them. He said that when he was questioned by an officer, this officer told him that he was not a suspect and that no criminal charges were going to be brought against him. David alleges that even after this, even after he was told that he wasn't a suspect, the Jodries had shown up to his house on two separate occasions calling him a murderer, a predator, and demanded that he pay for Tommy's funeral. So maybe we believe this account of things, maybe we don't. Maybe David's completely innocent and he's completely telling the truth. However, there are some things that came out that makes David a little bit less credible. So the crazy thing that came out after all of this was that David Knight actually had a criminal record. Now, initially, he did not show that he had a criminal record because it had been expunged. However, these records were dug up and turns out that David Knight actually has a felony conviction from 2003 for counts of continuous sexual molestation and oral copulation of a person under 14. The complaint alleges that between the years of 1993 and 1996, David Knight engaged in three or more acts of substantial sexual abuse against a child under the age of 14. And 
In this case, a witness said that David had provided this minor with alcohol during a camping trip to make them more easily convinced to sleep with him. This is just a side note, but stuff like this definitely should not be expunged from anybody's records because pedophiles don't deserve to live their lives normally without anyone around them knowing their disgusting sexual preferences and behaviors. Also, turns out that David only served 120 days in county jail for this charge. By 2006, David's lawyer somehow successfully argued that David should not have to register for California's sexual offender registry. Then, by 2007, David's lawyer got the courts to reduce his felony conviction to a misdemeanor, and then the entire thing was expunged. The victim's age, gender, and relationship to David have all been redacted from these court records. However, during the civil suit with Tommy's parents, they asked David if he ever in his life had been convicted of any felony charges, including ones that had been expunged, and he said no. They asked him if he had ever in his life been arrested for sexual assault, and he said no. He answered these same questions on a signed document under oath. So David lied under oath, so this can show that maybe David is not a reliable witness of the night of Tommy's death, so maybe the story he's telling isn't so accurate. But of course, David's lawyer came back at this and said that David just didn't know that he had to talk about his sexual convictions since they were expunged, even though he was asked straight up if he had ever been convicted of sexual assault even if it was expunged. Then, his lawyer says that his molestation conviction is not relevant to this case. But some think that it definitely is. So at this point, as you've probably gathered by now, the thought is that maybe David had actually pushed Tommy off of the parking garage. But some of you may be questioning, why would he do this in the first place? What would his motive have been? And why are these molestation charges related since they are against children and Tommy is a grown adult? And this is a completely different crime than the thing he's been convicted of. So we will talk about that in just a minute, but first I want to discuss why people think that this was not a suicide. First of all, even though Tommy had a little bit of depression, this was mostly because of his skateboarding accident and he was recovering and he was upset that he couldn't work or participate in any of the things he loved. I'm sure a lot of people have experienced the same thing, especially people who are active and love sports and love using their hands and love working. It's understandable that he may have been in a little bit of a bad place from his surgery and having to recover, but he knows that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that he's going to be just fine, and that he's going to recover from his injury. So it's not really thought that this would be a reason that he'd want to take his own life since, again, he was going to recover from this. He's a young man, he's healthy, he's active, and he would have recovered very quickly. He had a cactus and succulent business that he absolutely loved and was passionate about, and he was taking the steps to grow and expand his business. It it doesn't seem like if someone was really depressed or had thoughts of harming themselves that they would be going out of their way to grow their business and make their life better. Then we have the indisputable evidence that Tommy literally texted a friend that night saying that he was going to be home soon. Why would he have texted this friend if he was going to harm himself? Why would he have met up with this man in the first place in hopes of improving his business if he planned on ending his own life anyways? It really just does not seem that Tommy wanted to end his life in the slightest. And I know we can say that about a lot of people that we've covered cases on. It's always kind of said that, oh, this person didn't seem like they wanted to end their life. But, you know, sometimes it's possible that maybe they did. But in Tommy's case specifically, I really do not think that there's absolutely any sign that he wanted to take his own life. Then some people might argue that maybe the alcohol caused him to want to take his own life. But again, alcohol really only makes you do things that you were already kind of considering. It's the same thing that people say like, oh, they cheated because, you know, they were drunk or they were using alcohol but the person still cheated, so clearly they had thoughts of doing it outside of when they were drunk and when they were sober. That's just my opinion. I don't think people do things when they're drunk that are completely out of character that they would never think to do when they're sober. I do think that if someone's depressed, alcohol might exacerbate that and cause them to do things that they wouldn't do, but again, I don't think Tommy was that depressed or in that state of mind that alcohol would have caused him to act like that and to want to harm himself. So now that we've gone over that, let's get a little bit more into 
into the actual discussion of why many people think that David actually pushed Tommy off of the parking structure. So obviously we know that David had a ton of sketchy behaviors this entire night and his story doesn't really make much sense. How he went to this bar and didn't even have any of his own drinks himself but instead fed them all to Tommy. How he spoke to police about Tommy but told them that he didn't want to be on record as knowing Tommy. The way he said, how can you do this to me about Tommy after his death? How he randomly texted him F you once they arrived at the bar. How according to surveillance video, the two had gotten into a fight just before Tommy had died. All of this is just so weird and the biggest thing to me is that David changed his story. An innocent person doesn't change a story that drastically. But of course, we have to ask why would this random 57 year old man just want to push a 21 year old off of a parking structure when the two had only met up to just look at some art? So the thought here is that maybe he picked up Tommy with different intentions. That David planned to get Tommy's hopes up that he could grow his business with his photography skills. That he was also going to help Tommy improve on his own skills. But then when they showed up to Cal Poly to look at art, it just so happened to be welcome week, so they weren't even able to look at the art. Then, for whatever reason, they didn't go to any other art institute, which there's plenty in California, but they just decided not to go to one at all. So first, I wonder if David was actually the one who set up the date that the two met. Did he know that Cal Poly would be too busy? Is that why he picked that particular weekend? Who knows? It could have been a coincidence or it could have been planned. But then it seemed like once they couldn't go there, they decided to go out into nature to a beautiful place where they could see some natural art. Then they go to this coffee store where there's a funny show going on that Tommy wants to see, but David doesn't want to pay for the cover charge. Instead, he brings Tommy to a bar where he pays over a hundred dollars in shots that he didn't even drink himself. I'm all for buying everybody a round of shots, but not even drinking one himself is a little bit weird. It's also weird because he didn't want to spend money on a cover charge, but he willy-nilly spent over a hundred dollars on alcohol an hour later. So it's thought that maybe David got Tommy drunk on purpose with the hopes of sleeping with him. Now his criminal conviction of molestation happened 15 years before this. Maybe he decided that instead of getting caught up in another charge, he opted to sleep with people who were still very young, but were technically legal. Now, Tommy is five foot eight inches tall. He's a little bit skinny and he's kind of small. He has a bit of a baby face, so he looks very, very young. I personally can relate to this because I get mistaken for a high schooler all the time, even though I'm 23, and I've even gotten hit on by much older men even after them acknowledging that I look like I'm about to start college. So, I can completely see how this creepy older man has a thing for younger men and decided that he could get with a 21 year old who looks like he's 17 or 18 because that's kind of living out his fantasy without actually getting in trouble for it. So maybe he was sort of planting the seed throughout the day and then pressured him even further at the bar and then giving him drinks to maybe let his guard down and then he suggested sleeping together and that's actually what caused them to fight and then Tommy to run out. Maybe they'd even been kind of arguing a little bit all throughout the day and that is why David sent F you to his phone. That personally would make a lot more sense than him just checking to see if he was getting any other messages. And that was at the beginning of the night so that kind of shows that maybe he was planting the seed throughout the day and was trying to convince him lightly and then they'd gotten into a smaller argument so he texted him that and then he tried pressuring him even more like I said and then Tommy abruptly left the bar. Then I think it's possible that Tommy was running away from David and yelling for help because maybe David threatened him to take what he wanted from Tommy despite him saying no. Or maybe that was the plan all along. Maybe he never even brought up sleeping with him. Maybe his entire plan was to just get him so drunk that he was completely obliterated and had no idea what was going on. And then maybe after he knew that he got Tommy very, very drunk, he brought up this idea, said that he was going to sleep with him or let's go to a hotel or something, but he was still aware enough to 
know what David was suggesting, so that's why they got into a fight, and that's why he started running away. I think that this can be the perfect scenario for him, and we've seen the same type of thing happen in many other cases. He says that he can offer him his photography to help him grow his business. Maybe he said that he needed to sleep with him in exchange for his service. Either way, no matter how this entire thing played out, I think that maybe Tommy ran away, and that is when David chased him to the parking garage. Or maybe he ran, and then David lost sight of him, and then he called Tommy on his phone, which we saw that he did, and then told Tommy that he was sorry and would drive him home. So maybe, again, they got into this argument, he ran away, he said, sorry, I'll drive you home. So then they made the arrangement to meet up at the parking garage so that David could drive him home. Maybe once David had gotten up there, he tried to convince Tommy once again to get into his car so that he could sleep with him, or maybe he made the suggestion again that they go somewhere else to sleep together and then maybe a fight broke out because of this and then David just pushed him. I personally think that this makes perfect sense for how this would happen because if we believe David's original story that he was just so drunk that he was stumbling and falling over and over again, I wonder why Tommy by himself would make the decision to go up a bunch of flight of stairs, walk up stairs, and then go up this parking garage. I feel like if I'm stumbling around, falling everywhere, I'm not gonna just choose to start walking up stairs. I'm gonna find a bench or find somewhere to sit down. So clearly there was some reason that Tommy had to want to even go up on the parking garage in the first place. And I personally think that when David was telling his story of what happened, I do think that there was a hint of truth. I think that there was a hint of truth when it comes to his story of him running away from David and yelling for help. I personally don't think that he had met up with Tommy with the plan to kill him that night. I don't even think that he intended to bring him up there to push him off. I think that this was a heat of the moment thing so clearly by the time he went to police and spoke to them, he wouldn't have his story made up yet. So when he originally told police this story, he came up with the first thing he thought of, oh, he was running away and I just left him there and there was this entire gap of you know, I don't know what happened to him, and then suddenly I found him when you guys did. But then I think after having some time to think everything through, he suddenly came up with this story and made all of these crazy comments about how Tommy was acting erratically and treating everybody around them like trash. If that was the original story, why didn't David just come out and say that to begin with? Again, I think when people are caught up in the heat of the moment, caught up in a lie, they tend to make some story around some aspects that are actually true. This makes it so much easier to come up with something on the spot and then remember it later. So again, I think there are bits and pieces of his story that are true, but then again, there's just this big gap where suddenly they weren't even together and he has no idea what happened. I think him saying that they just weren't together and he just doesn't know what happened makes for a much better story than him just trying to come up with something and explain this in a different way. So then I think that after having several weeks to think about this and, you know, come up with a better story, he decided that he wanted to paint this story that Tommy was this horrible person. He was picking fights and maybe that's why people shouldn't care about him. Or maybe he wanted people to look at him as someone that was just acting crazy and out of character. And then that's what caused him to want to take his own life so that he could kind of line up his story with the idea that he wanted to take his own life. Again, I think that anytime someone changes their story so drastically, it calls for suspicion. And I think that David is hiding a lot. So that is kind of how I think it all may have played out. I know I just kind of rambled a lot and spit out a bunch of different ideas, but at the end of the day, I do think that it's possible that something went wrong. The two got into a fight over it, which caused Tommy to want to run away, and then David convinced Tommy to let him drive him home, and then another fight broke out, which resulted in Tommy being pushed off of the parking structure. I do not think that it was a suicide, and I honestly don't think that it really makes sense at all for it being an accident. That's why I'm not even really going to go into that idea because I don't really think that it makes sense that he got up all those stairs and then went over and leaned over the ledge for whatever reason and then just flew out. 
I don't really think that makes sense to me. I don't know exactly how high the bars are or how high the wall is on the parking garage, but as far as I have seen, they look to be pretty high. So just doesn't seem likely that he went over to them and then leaned over them for whatever reason and then just flew out. I don't think that's very likely. I do wonder if there's a way to sort of measure how far he was from the parking garage and then sort of decide what kind of trajectory would cause him to fall where he did. I know that's possible and I know investigators run a lot of tests like that and a lot of other investigations. So I hope that they're doing things like that to try to really get to the bottom of this instead of just assuming like, oh, it can't be determined because there was no witnesses. So let's just say it was an accident. Tommy's parents live in anguish every single day knowing that they lost their son so suddenly and so horrifically. They are so strong for being such amazing advocates for their son. A lot of information that I got came directly from their website and I think it's really so cool just how they're telling Tommy's story. As a true crime researcher, I can tell you that that does not happen a lot. They made it incredibly easy to read about their son's story rather than relying on you know, a bunch of different articles telling bits and pieces of the story and then coming up with something that makes sense. That's why I do what I do to put the information in a solid format into one case into a understandable timeline so that you don't get lost in a bunch of different articles trying to get a picture of the story. Sometimes even that's impossible for me. I read a bunch of different articles and there have been cases where I get a completely wrong picture and then in the comments I find out that I may have said a few things wrong or just made wrong assumptions based on things that I got from the articles. So again, that is why I do what I do because I try my best to get everything from bits and pieces of different articles. And sometimes it's over 20 articles that I'm finally getting enough information from. And it's very, very easy to get lost in all of those different articles. And it makes it really hard for the average person to want to even research cases. And so that's why I put in the footwork most of the time. But in this case, Tommy's parents put it all together for me. Of course, I did use a lot of other articles to include information that the parents did not include on their website. And obviously I wanted to be as unbiased as possible because of course it's their son and they wanna put forward information, but they also have a huge page about everything that Tommy loved, what he was like. And I just think that's so amazing. But everything that I presented to you has been fact-checked in a bunch of different resources and it is the most accurate and reliable information that I could find. But if you want to read more, go ahead and check out the website that his parents made, which will also be linked down below because again, it does outline a very good detailed story of what exactly happened to Tommy. The most recent update on this case came from December 23rd, 2020, and they said that they are very close to solving this case. They just need to hear from the person or persons who saw Tommy fall. At this point, they are heavily relying on the public to come forward with what they know. So right now they're offering a $10,000 reward. So if you do know absolutely anything about Tommy on the night of September 14th, 2019, please contacted their family. I've listed their website below. So all you do is put in your name and contact information and they will get back to you. And again, that is why I make these videos. I wanna spread as much information as possible so that if someone did happen to see something and they didn't even realize they saw something, they can come forward with what they know. This is yet another case that I do truly believe will be solved soon and it just needs the right person coming forward with the information that they know. So again, I absolutely urge you to use any of the contact information listed below to get into contact with somebody so you can come forward with what you know. So that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think this was a suicide? Do you think it was an accident? Or do you think that David Knight is responsible for Tommy's death? Let's discuss in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below and head over to birchliving.com com slash Rachel Shannon to get $200 off of your mattress plus two free pillows. Also, don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.